Hello, this is Mike Corrali with the Introduction to United States Government Course Online. Welcome. In today's lecture, we cover Chapter 6 in our textbook, American Government and Politics Today by Barbara Bartz, Political Socialization and the Role of the Media in the U.S. Electorate. This class, as all our other lectures, are taped before a live classroom so that you, the online student, can have the look and feel of sitting in class along with us, hearing your classmates ask questions and hearing me attempt to answer them. Welcome. Class is about to begin. Please take your seat. Thank you. Everybody's done the reading for tonight. Chapter 6 in Bards et al. Public Opinion and Political Socialization. And we know then that some of these terms are going to be coming up, like agenda setting, consensus, building consensus, the gender gap, uh, the generational effect, an opinion leader, political socialization, public opinion, a sampling error. We're going to be talking about all these and then some, so I'm so glad that you've done the reading because it allows you a jumping off place. This is our seminar question for this evening. How does the political socialization of the U.S. electorate add to or detract from the Madisonian model? How does the political socialization of the U.S. electorate add to or detract from the Madisonian model? And so, as always, what you want to do is build a strong thesis statement. Now, I would argue, this is pretty straightforward, that the political socialization of the electorate is both going to add to and detract from, that this is going to be not if, or, but a how and why. And so your thesis statement would look something like the political socialization of the U.S. electorate adds to and detracts from the Madisonian model. I would argue then that your first task is to define the Madisonian model. Remember, your reader knows nothing, absolutely nothing. You do. You know the Madisonian model backwards and forwards, but your reader doesn't. So in paragraph two, I would imagine your first task would be to define the Madisonian model. Paragraph three, define political socialization. Paragraph four, define the U.S. electorate. Ah, and that's a big part of what we're going to be doing tonight. So by the time you come out of tonight's class, you'll be able to do this essay with, with one hand tied behind your back. Okay? Fair enough? Here we go. Tonight's roadmap, then. We're looking at the historical and philosophic arguments to promote pluralism in democracy. We're going to be introducing and studying democratic theory. We're going to be looking at political socialization and its effect on public opinion. We're going to look at public opinion and its effect on pluralism. We're going to look at characteristics of public opinion. We're going to examine testing and reporting public opinion as a subset of public opinion and its effect on pluralism. We're going to look at the role of the media in developing public opinion, agenda setting, and the other functions of the media. And then we'll reintroduce our seminar question and go into depth. That's our roadmap for tonight. We start with the historical and philosophical arguments to promote pluralism in democracy. So we go back, as we want to do, to the Athenian city-states. In this instance, though, we're not going to go straight back to Aristotle and Plato. We're actually going to begin with Pericles. Pericles, who was an archon. An archon in ancient Greece was the executive. There were times when Greece, Athens, could go without an archon, could go without an executive leader and rely on pure democracy, pure policy making done directly by the electorate or directly by those in France. He said in the fourth century that the discussion among the citizens of the polis, of the city, was an indispensable preliminary to political action. And so he's talking about the value of pluralism and the value of public opinion in making public policy, right? In the fourth century BC. He says, our form of government does not enter into rivalry with the institutions of others. Our government does not copy our neighbors, but is an example to them. It is true that we are called a democracy, for the administration is in the hands of the many and not of the few. But while there exists equal justice to all and alike in their private disputes, the claim of excellence is also recognized. And when a citizen is in any way distinguished, he is preferred to the public service, not as a matter of privilege, 
but as the reward of merit. Neither is poverty an obstacle, but a man may benefit his country, whatever the obscurity of his condition. There is no exclusiveness in our public life. And in our private business, we are not suspicious of one another, nor angry with our neighbor if he does what he likes. We do not put on sour looks at him, which, though harmless, are not pleasant. While we are thus unconstrained in our private business, a spirit of reverence pervades our public acts. We are prevented from doing wrong by respect for the authorities and for the laws, having a particular regard to those that are ordained for the protection of the injured as well as those unwritten laws which bring upon the transgressor of them the reprobation of general sentiment. So he's talking about the value of living in a democratic society and how in a democratic society, respect among the population, in and amongst the population, is the watchword. That by virtue of having this participatory democracy, the people respect each other. It's a result of having a democracy. Check? So this is 4th century BC, Pericles and his funeral oration. The next Greek we have is Aristotle from 350 BCE. And in this instance, the Nicomachean Ethics, where he articulated an extensive philosophical rationale for the importance of this process, this deliberative process, this conversation, pluralism noting that the art of legislation was impossible without dialogue. You can't make law without having a conversation, says Aristotle. He continues, if liberty and equality, as is thought by some, are chiefly to be found in democracy, they will be best attained when all persons alike share in government to the utmost. So the more people participate, the more they contribute to the political discourse, the more liberty and equality we have in society is Aristotle's argument, again, in his Nicomachean Ethics in 350 BC. Our founding generation and their interpretation of what they were seeing in ancient Athens, we have two different interpretations from our founding generation of the philosophers coming from Greece. Hamilton, we know Alexander Hamilton. He was our first Secretary of the Treasury he, under George Washington. He saw the public as misinformed, apathetic, self-centered, and not to be trusted with the reins of power. To wit, he said in a speech urging ratification of the Constitution in 1788, quote, it has been observed that a pure democracy, if it were practicable, would be the most perfect government. Experience has proved that no position is more false than this. The ancient democracies in which the people themselves deliberated, here he's referring to the Athenian city-states, never possessed one good feature of government. Their very character was tyranny, their figure deformity. He said, men are rather reasoning than reasonable animals, for the most part governed by the impulse of passion. So Hamilton's got a point. I see some heads nodding out there. The man's got a point. But this is one side of the founding generation's thoughts. The other side is represented by Thomas Jefferson, right, our third president, first secretary of state. The Jeffersonians had greater faith in the common person. They, they believed people capable of self-government and that whatever faults they have as citizens is the fault of the institutions that serve them. To wit, whenever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government that whenever things get so far wrong as to attract their notice, they may be relied on to set them to rights. The basis of our government being the opinion of the people, the very first object should be to keep that right. What right? The right of participatory democracy. And were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, <laughs> I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter or newspapers without government. Because he's talking about the innate inherent ability of people to self-govern. So this is quite different from what Hamilton was saying. Two very different schools. Not unremarkable that Hamilton was a Federalist and Jefferson was the quintessential anti-Federalist. So we're going to be looking at parties in three weeks and we're going to see how this, the birth of these two different perspectives are going to translate into party ideologies.
Next, we have Louis Brandeis. Louis Brandeis, who was a Supreme Court justice, writing in 1927, so almost 100 years ago, but I think it's very eloquent. Those who want our independence believe that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties. This is Rousseau, right, the social contract. And that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. So the deliberative, the, the, the discursive, the thoughtful, debating, researching government should prevail over the knee-jerk, quick, passionate, arbitrary government. They believe that peop the greatest menace to freedom is an inert people, inert being or inactive, unparticipatory. That public discussion is a political duty this goes to Plato's allegory of the cave, and that this should be a fundamental principle of American government. So again, Louis Brandeis in 1927. Then we get to the saint of political science, V.O. Key, right? One of our quintessential political scientists. Wrote so many books, it's just embarrassing. Key summarizes the concept best when he pointed to the value of partisan diversity and high turnout as driving forces behind a successful democratic governance, i.e., in other words, pluralism. So partisan diversity is a diversity of parties. Partisan is relative to parties or describes parties. Right? A partisan diversity means a difference of opinion among parties, that that diversity is a driving force behind successful democratic governance, as is high turnout. Ah, so now you're getting to the idea of not voting and how not voting contributes or doesn't contribute to the political discourse, which is why I wanted to hold your question until this slide, because he answers it directly. V.O. Key said in his Public Opinion in American Democracy, the habit of non-participation, and again he's talking about the electorate, devolves into one-party states. He said, eliminating substantial blocks of citizens whose political interests and objectives, if activated, would furnish motive, moving power for important political movements and demands, undermines successful democratic theory and pluralism. First, the habit of non-participation. A habit. This is something that we become accustomed to. And so he's alluding to the idea of political socialization. That's the cornerstone of our lecture tonight. <laughs> habit of non-participation. You may miss an election every now and then. Maybe you have to work or you forget or you're really just not interested. There's nobody. But the habit of non-participation as it spreads throughout the electorate devolves the state into a one-party state. So this isn't party as in Democrat or Republican. If you think about it a little more broadly, this devolves the state into the one party of those who vote. Because those who don't vote by nature by definition, aren't participating. And so the habit of non-participation devolves the state into a one-party state, they who vote. They who vote then control the apparatus of government. So the problem with this is that by eliminating these substantial blocks of people who don't vote, they who don't vote, if only we could motivate them, if only we can get them up off their couches and participating, if their voice was heard, if they were activated, they would furnish the motive power, the moving power, for important political movements and demands. And their absence, their habit of non-participation, undermines successful democratic theory and pluralism. The o key. So what is this democratic theory that he's yammering on about? Well, and I'm going to yammer on about it too. We remember in federalism, we talked about the use of theory in political science. This was chapter three, and we talked about federalist theory. Anybody remember? How did we define theory in political science? Find the use of a theory in political science as a tool. A tool against which we can measure, perhaps quantitatively, subjectively, we can measure happenings in the political world, like the government shutdown, like raising the debt ceiling, like Supreme Court rulings. We can measure any political happenings against a theory, whether we looked at it 
federalist theory, then we could determine whether we were acting as a federal model by looking at those key elements of that theory. Just as with federalist theory, we have democratic theory. You with me? And so what are the elements of democratic theory? What has to be extant? What has to be available in order to have a successful democracy? Now, obviously, you're not going to have every one of these aspects every day all the time. That's the idea. You look at what's happening and you judge it against this perfect world, right, this democratic theory, to see how well we're doing and where we might improve. All right? So first and foremost, free and competitive elections. Bingo. Remember last week when we were talking about Martin Luther King and the March of Washington and that great quote that he said, a Negro in the South cannot vote and a Negro in New York has nothing for which to vote? Yes? That's what we're talking about here. Free, that you can actually vote, and competitive. It's really competitive, that you can get in there, you can run for office. Now, we know, Citizens United notwithstanding, that oftentimes money drives campaigns. So is the introduction of money or unfettered money, uncontrolled money into political campaigns going to harm democratic theory? If competitive elections are an element of democratic theory, anything that takes away from true competition can be seen to be harming democratic theory or harming democracy. Check? Okay, good. So, Again, it's not we are not a democracy. It is not we are not working. It is how well are we working and by what standards. Good. Political equality is second. That if you have universal suffrage, as we do, universal suffrage meaning that if you're over 18 and you're not a felon, you can vote. That's allowing the fullest possible suffrage, the fullest possible franchise, which means that when you go to the voting booth and you go to the voting booth, our votes count as one vote. Now, this is for procedural democracy. Going to the voting booth, the Negro in the South cannot vote. This is procedural. What about substantive democracy? Are we really politically equal? If you have $10 million, is your voice the same as mine? Now, if we go to the voting booth, check. But... If you have an undue influence on a campaign by virtue of very deep pockets, are we still holding true to political equality? Again, you know, this is an exercise against which to pass mechanisms, against which to judge mechanisms in our political system to see how well we're doing. Yes, Eventually, you're going to have to have majority rule. You're going to have to come to some kind of a, a decision. You're going to have to move and, and create policy. We're not running the country by unanimity, right? We're not ruling it by consensus. Not everybody's always going to agree, right? We're running by majority rule. So 50% plus one, or if it's two-thirds supermajority, whatever the, the mechanism necessitates, we live by majority rule. It also guarantees the protection of minority rights. Now, this was the big um, monster under the bed for... Madison, the tyranny of the majority, right? That a majority can run roughshod over a minority. So do you have the protection of minority rights? Is the minority cared for? How? In the deliberative process, in the legislative process, is the minority voice heard? Is it protected? If you have free and competitive elections, if you have political equality, if you have majority rule and protection of minority rights, I'll bet you dollars to donuts, you have a genuinely free press. Now, when I say a genuinely free press, I'm not talking about journalistic integrity. I'm not talking about the ability or the inability of the press to report. I'm talking about the freedom of the press to report what it wants to, that the government doesn't step in and force the press to say X, Y, or Z. Right? Now, we talked about prior restraint when we looked at chapter 4. We get that. Notwithstanding, do we have a genuinely free press? Free from whom? Free from government or free from some kind of um, overarching power that would shut it down and, and stop political discussion? Except for money. Except for money. <laughs> but that's not the government. Right. Okay. Bingo. Check. Exactly. Freedom of political information. A genuinely free press provides freedom of political information. So political information can flow within the government 
and within the population freely, without checks, without stopping it, without people acting as um, a barrier? Or, again, where is this challenged? Where is the freedom of political information being stopped? And by whom and, by, and how? And to what end? Or if not stopped, how, when, why, and by whom is misinformation being deliberately promulgated? When, how, why, and by whom are misleading stories being published? When, where, how, and by whom are we being led? Freedom of political participation. So this is the substantive democracy that we're after. Do you feel empowered to participate? Do you feel that you have a place in political society? Do you feel that your voice is heard? Do you feel that you have the freedom of political participation? Actual representation is tough. When our representatives or our senators go off to Washington, when the president goes off to the White House, when our governor goes off to the governor's mansion in Sacramento, do we feel actually represented? Are we being truly heard? Is our voice as the public being carried forward? I'm going to make an argument that our voice is when we elect our representatives. And from then on, according to founders' intent, they're on their own. We're electing them to go off to Washington to vote and to work on our behalf. Whether they listen to public opinion or not isn't necessarily a part of a successful democracy. So this is questionable, but it's an element that should be extant, should be available in democratic theory. Finally, the free evolution of political socialization. And that's what we're after tonight, to set up political socialization and its effect on public opinion. So you turn your eyes inward for a minute. You look at your own experience. And this is the fun part because we love trying to figure out how we've come to where we are today as individuals, right? Here we are and sitting in this class on a Monday night. How did we become the individuals that we are? How do we get the knowledge and the understanding that we have? And where are we going from here? Have you ever stopped to think why you have the political values you do? Where they come from? Are they your own ideas or have you been influenced by others? So we look around you in the room and, you know, we're talking a lot about the mass public, the attentive public, and we're going to be going into some definitions of those publics, and I don't want anybody to feel badly if you fall into the mass public category. Really, it isn't a indictment or a damnation. It's simply trying to apply an objective classification on a political experience. So... Political scientists call the process by which individuals acquire your beliefs and your attitudes political socialization. And as we're going to discuss, pu public opinion is grounded in political values. People acquire their values through political socialization, which is a complex process through which individuals become aware of politics, learn political facts, and form political values. Think for a moment about your own political socialization. What is your earliest memory of a president? When did you first learn about political parties? If you identify with a party, how did you decide to do so? If not, why don't you? Who was the first liberal you ever met? The first conservative? Obviously, the paths to political awareness, knowledge, and values differ among individuals, but most people are exposed to the same influences or agents of socialization, especially in childhood through young adulthood. These influences, as I'm going to suggest, are family, school, community, peers, and of course, television and the media, including internet and social media. As I'm going to discuss, political socialization continues throughout life. As parental and school influences wane in adulthood, Peer groups, neighbors, co-workers, club members assume a greater importance in promoting political awareness and developing political opinions. Because adults usually learn about political events from the media, newspapers, magazine, television, radio, and social media and the internet, the media emerge as socialization agents. Now, 
Older Americans, as we're going to see, are more likely to rely on newspaper and television news for political information, while younger Americans are more likely to turn to the internet and radio and magazines. Regardless of how people learn about politics, they gain perspectives on government as they grow older. We'll talk about this effect as well. They're likely to measure new candidates and new ideas against old ones that they remember. Their values may also change. Finally, Political leaning comes simply through exposure and familiarity. One example is the act of voting, which people do with increasing regularity as they get older. Just like regular socialization, when they send you off to kindergarten, right? Why they send you off to kindergarten is to become socialized, to learn how to share, to learn how to not bite, right? To learn how to not punch or pull somebody's hair. You're being socialized. You're being taught how to be social. Similarly, you have to be taught how to be political or how to think politically. This is called political socialization. So what people think about politics and how they come to think of it really is, as I'm going to show you tonight, of critical importance to the stability and the health of a popular government, of a democratically based government, because the beliefs and values of the people are the basis for society's political culture and that culture defines the parameters of political life and the limits of government action. So what you were saying about the mass public and most people being disinterested and disaffected is key. This is exactly what we're talking about. Those people, their beliefs and values are the basis for society's political culture. We look around us today and we look at voter turnout, right? Or we look at the lack of participation, the lack of interest. And how does that lack of interest, how does that lack of initiative define the parameters, the guideposts, the fences of political life, and how does it affect our government's working? How does it affect government action? So here are some key elements I think you'll find to political socialization, and this is when you look inward, and again, please don't take this personally, but take it as a challenge if you like. I'd love that. Political knowledge. If you find yourself with very low political knowledge. If you can tell me the name of both our senators, if you can tell me the name of your representative, if you can tell me the name of our governor and our lieutenant governor, if you can tell me the name of your city council or your mayor, if you can tell me the name of the president of this college, I would argue that your political knowledge is fairly strong. People tend to know more about personalities than policy. Tell me about policy that's gone through the legislature in the last year. Tell me 10 of the most important pieces of legislation that have gone through, and I'll give you a, a blue ribbon for high political knowledge. Most people, 85% of the public-ish, have lower political knowledge. This is evidence of a low political socialization. So in the United States today, the level of education is high, and surely media coverage of national and international events is off the charts extensive. We can agree on that. Yet, the average American displays really an astonishing lack of true political knowledge. Nevertheless, Americans do not let lack of knowledge usually stop them from expressing their opinions. They'll readily offer opinions on issues ranging from the coronavirus to capital punishment to the 2020-2021 election contest to nuclear power to the government's handling of the economy. When opinions are based on little knowledge, however, they change easily in the face of new information. The result is a high degree of instability in public opinion poll findings, depending on how questions are worded and on recent events that may bear on the issue at hand. The most thorough recent study of political knowledge was undertaken by scholars Deli Caprini and Keeter. In addition to conducting their own specialized surveys, they collected from existing surveys approximately 3,700 individual items that measured some type of factual knowledge about public affairs. They found that many of the basic institutions and procedures of government 
are known to half or a little bit more of the public, as are the relative positions of the parties on major issues. Basic institutions and procedures of government are known to about half of the public. Well, unfortunately, political knowledge is not randomly distributed within our society. In particular, women, African Americans, the poor, and the young tend to be substantially less knowledgeable about politics than are men, whites, the affluent, and older citizens. A key determinant in this is education. Education is the variable. It is the strongest single predictor of political knowledge. So, researchers have not found any meaningful relationship between political sophistication, political knowledge, and self-placement on the progressive conservative scale. That is, people with equal knowledge about public affairs and levels of conceptualization are as likely to call themselves progressives as conservatives. Equal levels of political understanding, then, may produce different political views as a result of individuals' unique patterns of political socialization. The higher your political socialization, the more interested you are in politics, the more you think, the more you learn, the more you breathe politics, the higher your socialization, the more political knowledge you're going to have. Think about any subject that you're interested in, and this is apart from poli sci for a minute. Look at your major or look at something that really fascinates you, whether it's, you know, the Red Sox, you know, or uh, music, or art, or dance, or um, literature, uh, your friends, your, your church, if there's something that really interests you, I'll bet you, I'll bet you that you know a lot about that subject, right? Because it interests you, just like politics. If politics doesn't interest you, you're probably not going to have a lot of political knowledge, which means that your political socialization is low. Another good indication of political socialization is the frequency of political discussion. How often do you sit around a table with your friends and talk politics? Ever? Every now and then? Never? Water down. Water, well, that's fine. But at least you're talking politics, right? You're trying to, to get, understand. That's fine. Maybe cold day in hell. I hate talking politics. I hate politics. It just drives me crazy. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I really don't care. That's fine. This is just a measurement of your political socialization. That's all. A sense of personal political efficacy, though, this is important. The capacity of power to produce a desired result, efficacy. How effective are you? Do you understand your place in political society? You get that you're one of 280 million Americans. Do you get your place in that 280 million? I've heard so many times, my vote doesn't count, Mike. Oh, why bother voting? My vote doesn't count. Wait a minute, wait, 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 what? It's just your vote? That's the only, that's the only mechanism for participating in this system, right? Well, give me more, right? What is your sense of political efficacy? How do you make a difference? How do you feel effective? If you turn up your hands, you throw up your hands, and you walk away and you say, my vote doesn't count, I would argue that pro you probably have a fairly low political socialization. Because the more political knowledge, the more frequency you have political discussions, the more you realize, what the heck? I can write a letter to my congressman. I could pick it. I could protest. I can wear an armband. I can stand on the steps of this library and burn an American flag. I can do anything. And I have a strong efficacy. Yes? Again, that's just evidence of a strong political socialization. Now, this one's going to blow your mind. The more political socialization you have, the higher your tolerance for diversity. Not diversity as in uh, suspect classes that your book talks about in Chapter 5. I'm talking about diversity of opinion. So when somebody says, you know, those Republicans, those Democrats, those Libertarians, why they ought to all be thrown into the ocean, right? If you have higher political socialization, you can say, that's fascinating. Tell me more. Why? Why do you think that? Why do you feel that? What have you read? What do you know that I don't know? Because it's going to interest you. If you have low political socialization, we tend to be what Hamilton talked about, reasoning rather than reasonable. We have the capacity for reasoning, but we don't use it. If you have low political socialization, you oftentimes will have a knee-jerk reaction to anybody who has an opinion different from you. 
because you have low political socialization, you're unwilling to hear other arguments. Right. You become stalled. You become set. Nationalism and chauvinism. The idea of nationalism, a sense of your place in civil society and in political society, is a good thing. And this is evidence of a high political socialization. Right? It can be likened to patriotism. Chauvinism actually is the idea that we, we collectively, we, if you're talking about the United States in this instance, have all the answers for the world. That we have the best political system ever, and everybody else should just copy us, and if they don't, they're just crazy. This is chauvinism. You've heard like male chauvinism, right? When the world is, is male-centric, and women are just, you know, they just happen to be here. It's a man's world. Male chauvinism. You get the idea. Chauvinism, right? Think of that politically. It's the United States world, right? Everybody else just better damn well fall in line because we have the correct system of government, right? Now, whether this is true or not, I'm not arguing, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm talking about this idea, this feeling of chauvinism because it goes back to tolerance for diversity, doesn't it? If we understand that there really are other political systems out there and they have their pluses and they have their minuses, that tolerance for diversity is evidence of a high political socialization. Your chauvinism is lessened when you have more political knowledge. Next, attitudes toward the police and the courts. The higher political socialization you have, the more you get the police's role in civil society. You've studied civil liberties. You've studied the Bill of Rights. You get the police job. You get the role of the courts. I hear, you know, cocktail parties, people ask me what I do, and I say, you know, I teach American government. The courts are usually the first place they go, all right? Those court, well, uh, you know, Understanding the role of the courts, we get Montesquieu, we get Rousseau, we get why the founding generation wanted to have a court that was protected from the public voice. We get why. And so the more socialization we have, the more education, the more understanding we have, I'm not saying that you're going to just, you know, throw flowers at the next cop you see, but you'll understand that the police and the courts have a place in civil society. Participation in campaigns and elections. This is where we get to the motivation to participate in political society through political socialization. The higher your political socialization, the more likely you are to participate in campaigns and elections. You may miss one, but you're not going to form that habit of non-participation. Check. So you may have heard yourself in this, and please, again, Remember that on some days, my political socialization is very low. Some days, I just don't want to hear it. I just get so frustrated, I don't want to hear it. Right? And so this is on any given day. And it's also relative to other aspects of your life. Yeah. If you're not passionate about poli-sci or about government, hey, that's cool. But I'm just trying to say this is the system. This is the mechanism that we use to judge how the electorate works. So as I said, you didn't rise fully formed from the cabbage patch, right? You didn't walk into this class just today, you know, just a brand new person. You are the sum total of all your life's experiences, yes? We said this when we talked about Plato's allegory of the cave. All the books you've read, all the movies you've watched, all the friends you've had, all the conversations you have make you the person you are today, right? You are the sum total of your life's experiences, yes? Yes? Yes, yes? good, okay. So what are those life experiences? How did you develop your political socialization? And why is this important to pluralism? Because pluralism is affected by political socialization. We want to know what the motive power is behind socialization so that we can try to determine what the electorate is and how it's going to behave. So family characteristics first. This is the most important of the primary agents of socialization. Interest formation is handed down in your family. Family holds similar political values and views and transmit them down. You want an example? I'm going to embarrass myself. 1976. <laughs> Presidential election. All right? And I remember that we were for candidate X. We were my family. My mom and dad. Right? And we were for candidate X. I didn't even understand politics. I didn't know what the president was. But boy, you know, it was just like the Red Sox, right? We were for 
this candidate. That socialization was already in my head. Right? I didn't even understand what we were talking about, but I knew that I was this party, or we were this party. We were for this candidate. Family characteristics. Secondary, school experiences. So off you go to school, and schools are going to help socialize you politically. Schools represent regional identities. right? So whether you go to school in Napa, or whether you go in Santa Rosa, or Bakersfield, or Fresno, or San Diego, or Atlanta, right? Different school districts are going to have different feels. They're going to have different regional aspects, regional attitudes that are going to be imbued in that school. So the schools are going to represent those regional identities and pass them on as Americanization. Americanization is a $10 word for the idea of political socialization as prescribed by the government through the curriculum. This is Americanization. This class is exactly that, right? Higher edu education simply continues the pattern that is created in lower um, K through 12. Next, we have socio-demographic influences. Let's say immigration status. What about gender, whether you're a man or a woman, or your income? How is that going to affect your political socialization? If you're trying really hard just to keep body and soul together and put food on the table, you may not have a lot of time to be interested in politics. Population density of the region that you live in. Um, politically competitive communities. You want a really quick example? Last year in Sonoma County, we had an uncontested election for county supervisor in the 5th district, my district. And he was a young, good-looking, very well-spoken, very elegant young man who was just a hands-down winner. I live in a, in a pretty heavily Latino community, our district, and so it was pretty much a done deal that he was going to get elected. Nobody was talking about the election. It was a snoozer. Until Ernie Carpenter, a former supervisor who was displeased with Efren, who had a bone to pick with Efren, threw his hat in the ring and ran against him. Ah, then the election started getting dicier. And then there was another woman from Sebastopol who really hated Ernie Carpenter. And she threw her hat in the ring just so that Ernie Carpenter wouldn't get elected. And all of a sudden you have a contested election. And it went from like this flatline election, flatline campaign, to a hotly contested election. Then I watched as the kids started getting into it. The younger generation started giving their voice. They really wanted Efren. And so they were going door to door handing out bumper stickers, you know, educating people. It became very contested. Yeah? So those kids, those young people, right, who were going from door to door, their socialization was changed forever by virtue of that race. They're never going to forget that race. And I'll bet you 10 to 1 their socialization increased to the point where they'll be regular voters from here on out. Isn't that amazing? Now, you know, when I talk about race or ethnicity or country of origin, that's a pretty dicey, broad statement, yes? And so I have this awful book, this terrible book, that was written about three or four years ago. It's called Trouble at the Border, A Contextual Approach to the Study of Immigration Policy in the U.S. And the author says, if these factors hold true, then, to quantify the political socialization of Latinos, first and subsequent generation immigration populations of the United States, it defies generalizations. When you say Latino... Right? and you're talking about political socialization, you can't generalize. It would be like trying to quantify all European immigrant populations of the 1890s and early 1900s. The identities created by historic regional and ethnic influences in the Latino population, country of Oregon, origin, family characteristic, educational influences, religion, income, gender, are distinct among the Latino population, as it is between the Hungarians, the Italians, the Poles, the Irish, the Slavs, and the English, in a very heterogeneous group, in a very different group, coming from Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Southern and Central American nations, Costa Rica, Colombia, Panama, Caribbean, and the Dominican Republic. It's as hard to quantify Latino as it is to quantify European immigrants, right? And so when you look at political socialization, oh, I'm the author, by the way. I wasn't just trashing him. It's my book. I can trash myself, right? So if you're looking at ethnicity or country of origin 
or any broad swath like Latino, you have to be cautious. There is a method to my madness here, because in the early 20th century, the major ethnic minority groups in America were immigrants from Ireland, Italy, Germany, Poland, and other European countries. They came to the United States in waves during the late 1800s and the early 1900s and found themselves in a strange land, usually without money and unable to speak English. Moreover, their religious backgrounds, mainly Catholic and Jewish, differed from that of the predominantly Protestant earlier settlers. These urban ethnics and their descendants be part, became part of the great coalition of Democrats that President Franklin Roosevelt forged in the 1930s. And for years after, the European ethnics supported liberal candidates and causes more strongly than the original Anglo-Saxon immigrants did. From the Civil War through the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and the 1960s, African Americans fought to secure basic political rights, such as the right to vote. Initially mobilized by the Republican Party, the Party of Lincoln, following the Civil War, African Americans later forged strong ties with the Democratic Party during the New Deal era. Today, African Americans are still more likely to support liberal candidates and identify with the Democratic Party. African Americans make up little over 12% of the population with sizable voting blocks in southern states and northern cities. Latinos are the most rapidly growing racial and ethnic group in American society, slightly surpassing African Americans as the largest U.S. minority group. Well, according to the 2020 census, as far as we know, Hispanics are commonly but inaccurately regarded as a racial group, although they consist of both whites and, and non-whites. People of Latin American origin are often called Latinos. If they speak Spanish, they're known as Hispanics. Hispanics, which consists of groups as different as Cubans, Mexicans, Peruvians, and Puerto Ricans, have lagged behind blacks in mobilizing and gaining political office. However, they make up 12.5% of the nation's population and constitute over 32% of the population in California and Texas and 42% in New Mexico. In these communities, Hispanics are being wooed by non-Hispanic candidates and increasingly are running for public office themselves. Both Asians and Native Americans account for another 4.5% of the population. Like other minority groups, their political impact is greatest in the cities or regions where they are concerned, concentrated and greater in number. Scholars have recently started to conduct more surveys of minority groups in order to have large enough numbers of responders to make generalizations about racial and ethnic differences in public opinion and political values, especially in political socialization. So while we're talking about race and ethnicity and immigration status, a couple of other socio-demographic influences that I'd like to introduce just very quickly as primary agents of socialization would include education and income. So as we know, education increases people's awareness and understanding of political issues. That's what this is about. Higher education also promotes tolerance of unpopular opinions and behavior and invites citizens to see issues in terms of civil rights and civil liberties. The more education people have, the more likely they're able to view a choice between personal freedom and social order and tend to choose personal freedom. With regard to the role of government in reducing income equality, we understand that people with more education also tend to favor freedom over equality. The higher their level of education is, the less likely respondents were to support government-guaranteed jobs and living standards. For income, well, in many countries, differences in social classes based on social background and occupation divide people in their politics. In the United States, we've fortunately been able to avoid many of the uglier aspects of class conflict, but here, Wealth sometimes substitutes for class. Wealth is consistently linked to opinions favoring a limited government role in promoting order and equality. Wealth and education have similar impact on opinion. The groups with more education and higher income tend to opt for freedom over equality. So next is church. Ah. 
Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Muslims, they all contribute to your political socialization. Or if you don't go to church at all, that's going to contribute to your socialization as well. For example, Catholics tend to be liberal on economic issues and conservative on social issues, generally, right? This is very broad swath. Protestants tend to be conservative on both economic and social issues. Jews tend to be liberal on social and economic issues. Muslims tend to be conservative on economic and social issues. So in addition to your family, in addition to your school, in addition to your race, your ethnicity, your gender, your income, your education, whether you live in a politically competitive community, now you add in religion. And you can see when I mean you're the sum total of all your experiences, I really mean it, right? Each individual person has a very distinct socialization. Uh, but we're not done yet, right? Your book talks about these. You saw this coming a mile, a mile away, right? Life cycle effect. So there you are, the perfect, you're all formed, done, right? Oh, no way. How your beliefs and behavior are going to change over time. For example, your political view prior to having a family versus after having a family. Before buying a home or after buying a home. You want an example? After buying a home, you're going to be watching your property taxes like a hawk. And you're going to look at supplemental bond issues coming out in the city's ballots. And you're going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I say yes on this ballot issue, my tax bill is literally going to go up $500 next year. How are you going to vote? Your socialization is going to change. Because if you own a home and you have that fish to fry, you have that worry, it's going to change how you work. It's going to change how you interact with politics. So in Marin, a few years ago, they had a bond issue that wanted to raise money for K-12 through schools, and it failed. Failed miserably, right? They tried it again, and they, in the next attempt, they exempted anybody over 65 from the property tax supplemental bond issue. Anybody heard of this? And it passed with flying colors. Why? Because the population 65 or over believed in K-12 through education, they just didn't want to pay the tax bill. Interesting. Period effect. How an historical event impacts an entire society. I'm thinking World War II or the Great Depression or the Vietnam War or 9-11 or the pandemic or even the insurrection on January 6, 2021 at the Capitol. So regardless of who you are, this historical event is going to impact your life. So now this is my parents' generation, bless their hearts, probably your grandparents' generation, but you know the savers, the people who save baggies and twist ties and newspapers and Kleenex boxes because you may need it. You never know, you may need it. Don't throw it away, you may need it. You know what I'm talking about, right? My parents did this. This is by virtue of being Depression-era babies. When you know deprivation, you don't throw stuff away. You save it, right? Now, you think, Mike, this is a silly, silly analogy. It's not. There was about seven, eight years ago when we as a country spent more than we earned. So my parents' generation always put money aside for a rainy day. They saved and saved and saved. And so as that generation started to die, started to leave the planet, right, it was replaced with my generation, and you guys, right, who tend to spend more than we earn. They saved. We spend. And so we as a country about, as I said, seven, eight years ago, went from the point of earning more than we spent to spending more than we earn. Right? This is an effect of that generation dying off. This is a direct socialization issue. Again, you're looking at politics, right? And you're a politician who's trying to figure out how my constituents are going to act on a certain issue. If you understand the demographics and you understand the socialization, it'll help better drive your decision-making. The cohort effect. So not an entire population, but a segment of the population affected by an event. For example, Vietnam War on men of draft age. So whether you were drafted and you went to war, whether you got a deferment for whatever reason, whether you absconded and went off to Canada, right? Men of draft age in the Vietnam era are going to be affected forever for their entire lives by living in that period. Similarly, the same period 
The Summer of Love, right? Hate Ashbury, Mario Savio, UC Berkeley, right? This idea of uh, the flower power, right? And the, the sexual revolution. Wow. Living in that era as a part of that cohort. Now, we're talking about anybody under 30, right? Don't trust anybody over 30. Anybody remember that line from Summer of Love? So those between, let's say, 16 and 30 are going to be affected by the Summer of Love. Those 35 and 65 aren't going to have the same effect. Right? Why the heck do we care about this? Next week, we're going to be talking about interest groups and why interest groups have exploded over the last 20 years, why the number and the power of interest groups have exploded. One reason is it's this generation. This generation, the participants of the Summer of Love, Kent State, UC Berkeley, right? The people who took power and, and took credit for ending the Vietnam War are now my age and older. And they believe that they can participate. They believe that they can change the world because of their socialization. And that's being affected, evidenced by the increase in interest groups. Public opinion and its effect on pluralism. So... We've seen political socialization and its effect on public opinion, right? If you have high political socialization, you're going to be participating in the political discourse. If you have low political socialization, you're not participating. And so then public opinion and its effect on pluralism is going to be seen through the characteristics of public opinion and testing and reporting public opinion. So everybody, public opinion defined. Having defined political socialization, we now can analyze its expression, the expression of socialization and public opinion through public opinion's role in policy making or in the great conversation in pluralism. First, however, it is important to establish the precise definition of the term, which is always what we do. This is going to be accomplished by deconstructing public opinion into its component parts. What do we mean by public and what do we mean by opinion? So when I say public opinion, what the heck am I saying? Accomplished by deconstructing public opinion into its component of parts. So the principal approaches to the study of public opinion and its effect on pluralism may be divided into four categories. One, the quantitative measurement of opinion distribution. In other words, when you look at public opinion, can you number, can you quantitatively point out, can you count noses, right, measurement distributions? Can you tell me how public opinion is divided? How is it distributed among the population? Can you quantify measurement of opinion distribution? Second, you want to investigate the internal relationships, and we're going to do this, among individual opinions that make up public opinion on an issue, starting from the role of the individual and then their place in civil society more largely, the public role of public opinion and communication in and among the media that disseminates that public opinion, how we speak to ourselves about public opinion. Right? How public opinion affects public opinion right? is another way of examining this. So public can be divided into three main categories, single issue publics, organizational publics, and ideological publics. So if you say public opinion is this, that's way too broad. That's way too big. You're not giving me enough information to make a rational understanding, to develop a rational understanding of that. Single issue publics are a collection of individuals who are attentive to and might mobilize on an issue. For example, abortion, same-sex marriage, the role of education in California, right? I don't care what the subject is. If you have a population, a collection of individuals who are attentive to, right, this dog whistle, they're attentive to gun control, they're attentive to abortion, or same-sex marriage, then you have a subset of the public who is going to be listening for and might mobilize on that one issue. So it's a single-issue public. So again, when you say public opinion, 
exactly who are you talking about? Are you talking about the single issue public? Because they're definitely going to have an opinion. Organizational publics. A collection of individuals who are attentive to and might mobilize on issues that impact the organization or its membership. So the defining characteristic then is the formal organization or the presence of a formal organization. So again, using our examples of abortion or reproductive rights or same-sex marriage or the role of education in California as single-issue publics, you also have an organizational public that might be at play. Abortion, reproductive rights, Planned Parenthood. Same-sex marriage, the Human Rights Campaign. Education in California, the California Teachers Association. You have organizations, formal organizations, who are attentive to and might mobilize on that issue. Check. So thirdly, you have an ideological public. And these are a collection of individuals who are attentive to and might mobilize on any issue that relates to its ideology. So an ideology, we know, is a collection of ideas. We covered this the first night, yes? Of how the world should work. It's a roadmap of how people look at what's happening and gives them an opportunity to judge whether something is right or wrong, good or bad. And so a collection of individuals who have an idea or an ideology based on political, social, economic, religious, moral, or ethical grounds. So that if you're looking again at reproductive rights, same-sex marriage, the role of education, somebody's political, social, economic, religious, moral, or ethical ideology will influence how they feel about reproductive rights, same-sex marriage, role of education. So when you say public opinion, you can see what I mean. That's way too broad. I need way more information. I need you to tell me exactly who you're talking about. Next, we have opinion. And opinion is an expressed attitude. This is important because we're going to have latent opinion or an unexpressed attitude, and that's going to come back to bite more politicians in the butt than you would imagine. Laden public opinion or unexpressed opinion is a very dangerous thing. So public opinion has to be expressed in order to fall into our definition. An expressed opinion. Now, your book talks about this. There are meaningful ways of expressing public opinion, such as voting in elections. Voting in election as an exercise of public opinion, not as simply exercising your franchise, but perhaps as a protest vote. To send the politicians a message. You ever hear that? I'm going to, I'm going to teach them. I'm going to send them a message by voting. So your voting isn't just a franchise. It's expressing public opinion. You're trying to get a point across. Direct communications. Writing your congressperson, fine. But what about um, town meetings? town hall meetings, or any kind of a forum like a um, supervisor's meeting where you can come together in a direct way, communicate with your elected officials. Direct communication is a meaningful way of expressing public opinion. What about organized group activities, right? This goes to organizational publics, protests, demonstrations, strikes, petition drives. These are all elements of um, meaningful ways of expressing attitudes. And then finally, participating in public opinion polling, right, in and of itself is a way of expressing your attitude. Now, there's another way of slicing and dicing public opinion, and that's to look at its characteristics. I would argue that there are five key characteristics that will help us understand, flesh out the idea. You with me? Distribution, intensity, stability, fluidity, latency, and salience distribution. This goes to, this is the slide that I was telling you about earlier, that you were, there are very few issues on which most Americans agree, not surprisingly. The normal situation is for opinion to be distributed among several different positions, right? Looking at the distribution of opinion can tell us how divided the public is on an issue, and it can give politicians an idea about whether compromise is even an option depending on how strong public opinion is. So we look at distribution in order to gauge whether compromise is an option. 
So what are the different types of public opinion distribution? How is public opinion distributed? I would argue three main categories. Mass public, attentive public, and the opinion makers. All right, here we go. The mass public. This is what I was referring to earlier in your question, right, about those who don't participate, don't get information, don't seek out information. And again, please don't take this as a condemnation um, if you find yourself falling into this category. Again, I do quite often, more often than I care to admit. The largest and least informed, 75 to 80 percent of the population is the most apathetic group. Apathetic, they just don't care. It's subject to the greatest fluidity of opinion and is thus is most easily manipulated of the three groups. Remember I said that a key element of political socialization is tolerance for diversity? Right? That you can, you can hear other people's arguments and um, uh, you, can, you can understand their arguments, you can get their points, you can form perhaps an improved decision based on the information that you're being provided. However, with low political socialization and low political knowledge, when you're introduced to a new concept or a new argument, you often take it hook, line, and sinker. Because you don't have the political knowledge to understand that it's a complex issue, you tend to take it at face value. You tend not to think it through very deeply. I said in the beginning that we might not know <laughs> our senators' names or our representatives' names, right? If we know anything, it's usually the politicians' names and faces. The person-to-person -person dynamic, the human dynamic, allows us to know more about an individual personality than policy. So if those people who know even who their senators are or their representatives are, if they're part of the attentive public, this is where you'll really begin to understand them. 27% of those polled knew who their representative in Congress is. 27% polled knew who their representative was. This is the mass public. 60% could name one of their senators. So this is the personality. This is the person to person. The next one is their knowledge of policy. So if you guys remember in 1994, this is probably before your time, there was a big hue and cry about NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Does this ring a bell to anybody? It was supposed to be a free trade agreement between Canada, Mexico, and the United States to allow for goods and employment to flow in between. It was kind of like a starter kit for the European Union. All right? And it was huge. It was huge because the United States was seen as giving up sovereignty and it was gonna, all hell was going to break loose and the sky was going to fall. And it was just as big as the Affordable Care Act, dot, 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 Obamacare, dot, 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 is today. I mean, it was that big. Yet, six months after it was passed into law, 60% of Americans polled said that they had never heard of it. Not that they understood it or didn't understand it or didn't quite get all the arguments for it or agreed or disagreed, never heard of it. And again, it was as popular as the Obamacare discussion is today. This is the mass public that we're talking about. The attentive public is 15 to 20 percent of the electorate that's considered the attentive public because it's better informed and more interested in policy issues. Again, you may not know everything, but you're better informed and more interested. And again, this is an identifier of high political socialization. This group has general awareness of the issues and tends to have well-developed and consistent opinions, right? That goes right up uh, the flagpole with political socialization. But here's the catch. They generally only express themselves politically when they vote. Those people with higher political socialization tend not to demonstrate, tend not to picket, tend not to attend town hall meetings as a rule. They only express themselves when they vote. So you were talking about politicians, right? And how a politician might gauge their campaign and might they direct it to a set of the population or not. So if you have the mass public who is very excitable and is very passionate and will get up there and get out there and demonstrate, but they don't vote, and you have the attentive public who's quieter, more sedate, doesn't picket, doesn't protest, but votes regularly and is more aware of policy issues, if you're a politician with a hard-earned campaign dollar, where are you going to spend it? 
Who are you going to try to attract? Are you going to mollify the mass public who doesn't vote? Or are you going to try to get the attentive public on your side? So you can see how public opinion, in this case political socialization, is going to drive the Madisonian model. The Madisonian model includes the electorate and the role of the electorate in the balance of power, yes? That whenever government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. Thomas Jefferson said, I'd rather have or newspapers without government than government without newspapers. That the American public can be trusted to set it to rights. This is what we're talking about. It never dawned on me that I would have to make this clarification, except after the insurrection of January 6th. When I talk about people setting government to right, I mean to do so through legal processes, <laughs> legal procedures, through constitutional mechanisms, and surely not through um, insurrection. Political socialization and its effect on the Madisonian model. Finally, opinion makers. 5% informs and shapes the view of others. These are the people who live and breathe politics. They're pretty, they're pretty set apart. These are the party leaders, the business executives, the government leaders, the, 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 the high, high, high socialization, people who live and breathe this stuff. Their interest level, knowledge, and political activities set them apart from everybody else, obviously. And they are the most informed, not surprisingly tolerant and consistent in their views. Another characteristic of distribution is intensity. Intensity refers to how strongly people feel about an issue and if they're willing to express their private opinions. Intensity is often critical in generating public action. An intense minority can often win on an issue of public policy over a less intense majority. For example, public opinion on abortion hasn't changed much in the last 20 years. And yet, if we listen to the policy-making discussion, if we listen to what's going on in the news, we hear abortion come up again and again and again. Yes? Coming back from Roe v. Wade, we hear it again and again and again. Even though those people who are pro-life are minority, because they're an intense minority, a very intense minority, they drive the conversation. And they keep bringing it to the public sphere again and again and again. An intense minority can often drive policy making over a less intense majority. What about stability and fluidity as a characteristic of public opinion? Sure, stability refers to the extent to which public opinion remains the same over time. Imagine the effects of the Civil War on the South. So the South was solidly democratic from 1865 to 1968, 103 years. Anybody guess why? Lincoln was a Republican. Yes? And so the South was solidly Democratic from 1865, the close of the Civil War and Reconstruction, until 1968. What happened in 1968? Lyndon Baines Johnson in the Civil Rights era and those Democrats. And so they went from being Democrat back to being Republican, and the Southern strategy is to capture, we'll talk about that when we talk about parties, the Southern strategy to capture the southern states because they tend to vote very in a very stable manner for a very long time. The opposite of that is fluidity, how quickly the public changes its mind. For example, George Herbert Walker Bush, the father, right? Job approval rating in 1989, 54%. That's good. Any president would be proud of that. 1990, 70%. 1991, 90%. And yet in 1992, he lost the election to Bill Clinton. Why? 1991, the first Gulf War. And so rally behind the president, the commander-in-chief, 1991, 90%, nearly unprecedented support. And then 1992, for those of you who remember, we had a terrible recession. The economy went to hell in a handbasket, and George Herbert Walker Bush took the blame. Bill Clinton's campaign strategy, his staffer's campaign strategy was, it's the economy, stupid. In other words, whenever they wanted to get off message in the Clinton campaign, it's the economy, stupid come back to a message. It's the economy, the economy, the economy, and they won. Stability, fluidity. You see these two key characteristics. Again, latency is when people don't know. Oh, they know. When they say they don't know, their mind is often made up. They may have reasons why they don't want to say what their opinion is, but they have an opinion. 
And that's latent opinion. It exists, it's just not expressed. So politicians pay attention to these hypothetical questions and answers in order to gauge potential opposition to programs. So if there's latent public opinion out there that is very against a policy, politicians would be well served to know that that latent public opinion exists. Otherwise, it's going to come back to destroy their career. If they move and they try to create a public policy that's against a latent public opinion and the public lashes out, salience. We say that an issue is salient when it's widely publicized, when it's known about, when it's important. When people are talking about it. President Trump's second impeachment, the COVID vaccine, Georgia flipping blue, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, MAGA. There's high salience because it's on everybody's lips. Everybody's talking about it, yes? All these issues are salient. They're strong and influential on public opinion. Now, this is important because it's the media that frames the agenda. We get our political information from the media. If the media is talking a lot about something, we're talking a lot about something. And so it builds salience. And if something has strong salience, the idea that it's going to be on the agenda, on the national to-do list, is very strong. So salience, as a characteristic of public opinion, is very important. Our next topic, then, is why to test public opinion. And remember, what we're doing is looking at public opinion and its effect on pluralism. And now we've done the characteristics of public opinion, so our next task is testing and reporting public opinion. So why test public opinion? There are other reasons to understand how public opinion is formed and measured than simply to avoid being manipulated by those polls inappropriately. For example, individuals, you guys sitting here in class, are going to be making major decisions, major life decisions based on polling. Right? If you're looking at a career choice, if you're looking at going into nursing or going into teaching, then public opinion polling about nursing, about teaching, about these careers that should, I would argue, be driving part of your decision-making process. Are there going to be jobs for you out there right, when you graduate with your degree? And a lot of this is going to be tied into public opinion polling, what the future of your discipline will be. So we not only make political decisions based on public opinion, but also personal and career decisions as well. So this part of this lecture then speaks not only to politics, but to your personal life as well. To participate in political discourse, pluralism, in an informed and analytical fashion, as a deliberative population, not a knee-jerk or arbitrary population, Americans have to come to grips with public opinion polls. It's a useful tool of government and a good source of information. H.G. Wells is famous for having said, statistical thinking will one day be as necessary for efficient citizenship as the ability to read and write. Being able to look at and examine statistical analysis and public polls is going to be a really important part of making an informed decision. To that extent, we're looking at polling and democracy. Some proponents of more traditional, representative, democratic theory welcome public opinion polls because they provide systematic information on the preferences of the citizenry. Now, this goes back to my original point that our founding generation didn't see this as a direct democracy. They didn't see the representatives going to Washington to vote our opinion. We elected the representatives to go and do their job, to run government. And so the more traditional thinkers in our country believe that public opinion polls provide systematic information on the preferences of the citizenry, but then it's also argued that citizens' opinions should influence the behavior of their elected reps, and that any mechanism such as polls that provide information on, public, on citizens' opinions are bound to foster democracy. So these are two different schools of thought. Do we elect our representatives to go to Washington to do their job, to run the country, and should they then listen to public opinion or not? Is this a direct democracy or even a quasi-direct democracy or not? It's neither fish nor fowl, right? We expect both. Ah, 
So opponents argue that polls give a misleading impression of how a representative democracy actually operates, this republic that we have. That is misleading to think that polls provide us some kind of input into the decision-making process. It really doesn't. That being said, being a savvy consumer, what would, should you ask about poll results? When you see a poll represented in the newspaper or on television, when you hear statistics being thrown at you, do you just gobble them up or do you think about them? Do you ask questions? To be an informed consumer, you would ask, who did the poll? Who paid for it? And why was it done? How many people were interviewed in the survey? How were they chosen? What area of the nation, the state, or the region, and from what group, teachers, lawyers, Democratic voters, were these people chosen from? Are the results based on the answers of all the people interviewed, or just some? Who should have been interviewed, and who wasn't? Or do response rates really matter? When was the poll done? How were the interviews conducted? What about the polls on the internet or the World Wide Web? <laughs> you heard of freeping polls, right? When you want to screw up a poll, you put out something on Facebook, go and freep this poll so that all your friends and contacts will go and vote a certain way and mess up the outcome of the poll. What is the sampling error for the poll results? What were the questions asked? The entire question. What order were the questions asked in? I have all examples of these. I'm just not leading you down the primrose path, right? What other polls have been done on this subject or on this topic? Did they say the same thing? Did they come to the same conclusion? If they are different, how are they different? And so all these are from the National Council on Public Polls, right? Which is the definitive nonprofit organization that strives for accuracy in media reporting. They've come down with a list of what they call the principles of disclosure. It takes these 20 questions and, and kind of boils them down to the sponsorship of the survey, the dates of the interviews, the method of obtaining the interview, the population sampled, the size of the sample, the size and description of any subsample, and the complete wording of the questions. For example, sponsorship. Five of the, the better known and most trustworthy of the nationwide polling organizations are, and you've heard of these, I know, Gallup, the New York Times, the Washington Post, ABC, CBS. These are trustworthy polling institutions who adhere to the principles of disclosure. So when you see a poll results put out by Gallup, you're going to see the complete wording of the question, the dates of the interviews, the sample, the statistical analysis. So sponsorship is important. Who's paying for the results? Because you can bet your bottom dollar that those who are paying for results are going to get the results that they're paying for. Is tobacco addictive? Depends on who's asking the question. If it's the tobacco industry, you're going to get a very decided response as opposed to perhaps the American Heart Association, the American Lung Association. The dates of the interviews are so important. When was the interview conducted? I hear so many times, on, especially on television, citing data, citing statistics that are 7, 8, 10, 20 years old and have no relevance on today's world. They may have been true 20 years ago and you can cite them till you're blue in the face, but then, oh, that's right, the internet happened. And we've had huge changes in how we process information. So the dates of the interviews are important. For example, we have the Supreme Court coming down, invalidating one aspect of the Voting Rights Act. It didn't want to invalidate the idea of controlling states' ability to manipulate access to the polls. What it did was to ask them to update their information. They were going off statistical analysis that was 50 years old of parts of the country that had historically used their power to disenfranchise suspect populations that your book talks about in Chapter 4 namely race. But the data was 50 years old. So the idea of dating the interviews or dating the polls is really important to see if it's really relevant today. And if so, how? So redo the polls, get new information. If it's the same, it's the same. If not, how the interview was obtained. 
For example, is it a random digit dialed telephone sample? Is it a list-based telephone sample where they just go one, 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 one? Is there an area probability sample where you scatter based on probability across a wide swath of geography? Was it a mail sample? Was it an opt-in internet panel? Was it a convenience sample? Is there any use of oversampling? In other words, if you have a phone, you'll be sampled. If you don't have a phone, or if you don't carry one, or if you don't respond to phone interviews, you're not going to be sampled. So using a phone is an incorrect, well, it's a suspect mechanism to achieve a really good poll. Mail samples. How many people in here actually return mail polls? How many people take internet polls? You see the problem. Getting a poll result that is statistically viable is tough. So how you obtain the interview is important. What about the population sampled in the size of the sample and the size of the subsample? For example, the Hawaii State Senate recently held hearings when it was considering a law requiring that motorcyclists wear helmets. Not a bad idea, not a bad policy, but they held hearings to consider the law. They were trying to increase their understanding of public opinion. And so some motor, motorcyclists testified that they had been in crashes in which helmets would not have helped. Who wasn't at the hearing? Yes, ma'am. All the people who died. All the people who died, or the people who were unable to or somehow make the hearing. Yes, exactly. So I want to see the population sample so that I can make an informed decision. Oh, that's right. They didn't ask the people who had died. Yes. So the complete wording of questions and the use of leading questions. Now you guys have heard this stuff. So a 1985 poll began by telling respondents that Star Wars weapons could destroy nuclear weapons fired at the United States by the Soviet Union or other countries. It then stated, supporters say such weapons would guarantee protection of the United States from nuclear attack and are worth what they cost. Opponents say such weapons will not work, will increase the arms race, and that the research will cost many billions of dollars. How about you? This is it. This is a leading question, guys. Would you say you approve of plans to spend billions and billions of dollars to develop untried and untested space-based weapons? Duh. Right? Of course you're going to say no. Because this version of the survey included two positive and three negative arguments. A third version of the question was tried four months later that admitted such phrases as, such weapons will not work. The results of the first version, the one that I read you, 41% in favor, 53% opposed. The second version that had equal arguments and taking out the suspect phrases yielded 48% in favor and 46% opposed. It changed drastically from a majority to a minority, the people who voted yes or no. You see? Leading questions, right? So that's why you want to see the question in its entirety. This is another great leading question. You may know in 1974, Jerry Springer, who had gotten married six months earlier, was arrested on morals charges with three women in a hotel room. He also used a bad paycheck to pay for the women, a bad check to pay for the women's services, and subsequently resigned in disgrace as mayor of his city. Are you likely, somewhat more likely, or less likely, to support Jerry Springer for governor this year? I want to see the entire question. If you just gave me, are you likely, I have nothing to base that on but other information. You're leading me. And it was a leading question. There are election polls that we pay attention to as well to know how a campaign is progressing, how a candidate is faring. Now, this is important if you think about it, not just to the electorate, but to supporters of the candidate. If a candidate is meant to garner support to gain both monetary, but also political leverage, political backing, you want to know if that person is electable, right? So if you're Jerry Springer, and they came out and said, that as of today, Jerry Springer's approval rating, would you vote for Jerry Springer today for governor? 99.99% said no. And so you, as a person who might be backing Jerry Springer, will use this political information to participate in his campaign, or not. Or not. So we're talking about free and competitive elections and how public opinion and public opinion polling affect that, right? 
So these include benchmark, trial heat, tracking poles, and exit poles. You may have heard these terms. Your book talks about them. Benchmark determines electability of candidates. A benchmark survey collects information about public image of candidates, their positions on issues, name recognition levels, electoral strength vis-a-vis -vis or in relation to their opponents, and citizens' evaluation of the incumbent office holder. This is that Jerry Springer question. An electability question. Starting off place, if you're going to have free and competitive elections, the outcome of this question is very important. A trial heat poll. If the election were held today, who would you vote for? This lets a candidate know how they're doing, and it lets their backers know how they're doing. But it's also an element of bandwagon. And we're going to talk about bandwagon as a propaganda technique. 99.9% .9 of people are voting no on Jerry Springer. Snowball's chance of getting elected. Trial heat, his electability then is zero, which is just going to further his ride down the rabbit hole. Tracking polls are done by a campaign, most often on a daily basis near election day, to monitor closely any late shifts in support. Provides information for any last-minute shifts in campaign strategy or media advertising. Exit polls are interviews with voters as they are leaving the polling places. Now, next week, we're going to be talking a great deal about exit polls when we talk about interest groups and electioneering. So stay tuned. However, there is a problem of in-person and face-to-face -face questions, especially on social issues that are dicey. People tend not to answer face-to-face. -face. What happens in the polling booth is private. And sometimes they refuse or they'll lie if it's an unpopular decision. And they're talking to a person they'd rather not let them know how they feel. So exit polls are a little dicey. Going back to tonight's roadmap, what we've done is looked at the historical and philosophical arguments to promote pluralism. We've looked at democratic theory. We've talked about political socialization. We've defined it and its effect on public opinion. We've looked at public opinion and its effect on pluralism, the great conversation, by looking at characteristics of public opinion, distributions, salience, latency, and testing and reporting public opinion. But as I said, public opinion really comes down to the role of the media. Public opinion, how it's reported, how it's put out there, is a commodity of the media. We don't do, you and I, independent poll. We don't go out to our friends and say, how do you feel about it? It's always a mediated piece of information. In other words, the media is presenting the poll statistics to us or public opinion to us. And so then understanding the role of the media in developing public opinion is as important as understanding public opinion itself. So the media's role on the political discourse, on pluralism, is huge. It's how we talk amongst ourselves. So we're talking about the media's ability to set the agenda and its functions in a democratic society. It seems we never talk anymore is a common lament of couples who are not getting along very well. Well, in politics, too, citizens and their government need to communicate in order to get along well. Kenneth Jonda, in his book, The Challenge of Democracy, suggests that communication is the process of transmitting information from one individual or group to another. Mass communication, then, is the process by which information is transmitted to large, heterogeneous, widely dispersed audiences. The term mass media refers to the means of communicating to those audiences. The mass media are commonly divided into two types. Print media, such as newspapers and magazines, that communicate information through the publication of written words and pictures, and broadcast media, radio and television, which communicate information electronically through sounds and images. The World Wide Web, the Internet, obviously, can also be classified as a broadcast technology since it fits this definition, and the Internet, as we know, has grown in size such that it also qualifies now as a mass media. Our focus here is on the role of the media, then, in promoting communication from government to its citizens and from citizens to their government, right? The basis of a pluralist society is that communication 
the sharing of ideas, the sharing of information that we've been yammering on now for uh, an hour and 30 minutes almost, right? So in a totalitarian government, then information flows more freely in one direction from government to the people than in the other. In democratic governments, as I'm suggesting, information must flow free, freely in both directions. A democratic government can respond to public opinion only if its citizens can make their opinions known. Moreover, the electorate can hold government officials accountable for their actions only if voters know what their government is up to, is doing, and plans to do. Because the mass media, and increasingly the group social media, provide the major channels for this two-way flow of communication, they have the dual capability of reflecting and shaping our political views. The media are not the only means of communication between citizens and the government. Again, agents of socialization, especially schools, right, function as linkage mechanisms that promote such communication. So alongside the four most traditional forms of mass media, newspapers, magazines, radio, and television, the internet has grown into an important conduit of political information back and forth. What we today call the Internet actually began in 1969 with support from the U.S. Defense Department's Advanced Research Projects Agency. Computers of four universities were linked to form the ARPANET. In its early years, the Internet was used mainly to transmit messages, known as electronic mail or email, among researchers. When I started at Sonoma State University in 1989, we were just beginning to use email. It was a fascinating time. In 1991, a group of European physicists divide a standardized system for encoding and transmitting a wide range of materials, including graphics and photographs over the, the Internet, what was called the World Wide Web. In January of 1993, there were really only 50 websites. Today, obviously, as you know, there are literally millions, and virtually every government agency and political organization has a website. While only 5 million Americans were connected to the Internet in 1995, by 2004, approximately two-thirds of Americans were online. The Internet has also created a new venue for traditional print media outlets to offer their wares. On the web, local publications like the Topeka Capital Journal are no, no more difficult to access than national newspapers like the New York Times. What television networks like ABC and CNN and Fox offer in national and international news exists alongside local coverage of individual stations. The development of the Internet also allowed millions of individuals to create and publish their own web pages, giving them the opportunity to shout from their own soapboxes. Unlike the high startup costs inherent in traditional media like newspapers and television, now anyone with a PC can post pages on the web, not even to mention Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or any other platform that is now absolutely free and gives platforms to anybody with a, an iPhone. Important stories have broken on the internet. Matt Drudge, an internet gossip reporter, learned that Newsweek, for example, had gathered information in early January of 1998 on possible sexual relationship between President Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. But was sitting on the story, reluctant to report hearsay about the president's sex life. Well, Drudge, who publishes virtually everything sent to him, posted the story on his website, the Drudge Report, that you're familiar with, and from there the story moved into internet news groups and then into the conventional mass media with a discussion on ABC's This Week, The Next Morning, and well, we all know where that went. So, in the United States, people take private ownership of the media for granted. In other Western democratic countries, the print media, both television, or the print media, both newspapers and magazines, are privately owned, but the broadcast media often are not. Private ownership of both print and broadcast media in the United States gives the news industry in America more political freedom than any other in the world, but it also makes the media more dependent on advertising revenues. To make a profit, the news operations of the mass media in America must appeal to the audiences they serve, right? The primary criterion of a story's newsworthiness is usually its audience appeal, which is judged according to its potential impact on readers or listeners. Its degree of sensationalism, well, exemplified by violence, conflict, disaster, or scandal, its treatment of familiar people or life situations, and its close-to-home character, and its timeliness. 
So media owners can make more money by either increasing their audiences or acquiring additional publications and stations. A decided trend toward concentrated ownership of the media increases the risk that a few major owners can control the news flow to promote their own political interests. In fact, the number of independent newspapers has declined as newspaper chains, owners of two or more papers in different cities, have acquired more newspapers. Only about 400 dailies are still independent as of 2021, and many of these papers are too small, unprofitable to invite acquisition. Well, as with newspapers, chains sometimes own television stations in different cities and ownership sometimes extends across different media. None of the three original television networks remains an independent corporation. NBC is owned by General Electric. ABC, as you know, is owned by the Walt Disney Company and CBS by Viacom. So although the Viacom name may not be well known to many college students, its other holdings are, in addition to CBS, Viacom brands include, well, MTV, VH1, Paramount Pictures, Showtime, UPN, Nickelodeon, TNN, CMT, Infinity Broadcasting, and uh, Simon and Schuster, the publisher. Well, and we know all too well that the Fox network is owned by the Rupert Murdoch News Corporation. So, although most of the mass media in the United States is privately owned, they do not operate free of governmental regulation, right? The broadcast media are subject to regulations more so than the print media. This is because of the Federal Communications Act of 1934 that created the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, to regulate the broadcast and telephone industries. When we get to the chapter on bureaucracy, we're going to be talking a lot about the FCC, so tie a string around your finger for this one. The FCC has five members, no more than three from the same political party, nominated by the president for terms of five years. The commissioners can be removed from office only through impeachment and conviction. Consequently, then, the FCC is considered an independent regulatory commission. It is insulated from political control by either the president or Congress. Today, the FCC's charge includes regulating interstate and international communication by radio, television, telephone, telegraph, cable, and satellite. We know too well that the First Amendment to the Constitution prohibits Congress from abridging the freedom of press, and as well should be. However, over time, the press has come to mean all mass media, and the courts have decided many cases that define how far freedom of the press extends under the law. The most important of these cases are often quite complex. Usually, the courts strike down government attempts to restrain the press from publishing or broadcasting any information reports or opinions that it finds newsworthy. One notable exception concerns strategic information during wartime. The courts have supported censorship of information, such as sailing schedules of troop ships or the planned movements of troops in battle. Otherwise, they have recognized a strong constitutional case against press censorship. Because the broadcast media are licensed to use public airwaves, they are subject to additional regulation. Beyond that applied to, let's say, print media of the content of news coverage. The basis for the FCC's regulation of content lies in its charge to ensure that the radio and television stations serve the public interest, convenience, and necessity. With its Equal Opportunities Rule, the FCC requires any broadcast station that gives or sells time to a candidate for public office to make the equal amount of time available under the same conditions to all other candidates for that office. The Reasonable Access Rule requires that commercial stations make their facilities available for the expression of conflicting views or issues from all responsible elements in the community. Two related rules were struck down by a U.S. Court of Appeals just in 2000. The political editorial rule required stations that endorsed a candidate to provide free reply time to their political opponents. The personal attack rule required stations to provide free response time to candidates and others whose integrity was attacked on the air. Opponents of these rules have long charged that they stifle debate by discouraging broadcasters from adopting editorial positions. So it's probably at this point that you're asking, Mike, Mike, this doesn't sound like what I'm seeing on CNN or Fox or MSNBC. Does the FCC's regulatory powers extend to cable channels? No. The FCC's regulatory powers extend only to over-the-air broadcasters 
who transmit their programs via the publicly owned spectrum. So cable channels needn't follow any of these rules. So if you're, you're thinking, wait a minute, this doesn't sound right. This doesn't sound like Fox or MSNBC or CNN. You're right. So too, obviously, for internet companies, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, you know, as well as I, the battles that have been happening in the legislature between Congress and Facebook, Congress and Twitter, to try to start to regulate these platforms to provide some kind of truth gatekeeping function. Well, that process continues, and I'm sure it'll go on for a number of years. Well, we know that media executives, news editors, and prominent reporters functions function as gatekeepers in directing the news flow. They decide which events to report and how to handle the elements in those stories. Only a few individuals, no more than, let's say, 25 of the average newspaper or news magazine and 50 at each of the major television networks, actually qualify as gatekeepers, defining the news for public consumption. That's a pretty limited amount of people. They not only select what topics go through the news for public consumption, they not only select what topics go through the gate, but are also expected to uphold standards of careful reporting and principled journalism. Well, in contrast to the print and broadcast media, the internet has no gatekeepers and thus no constraints on its content whatsoever. The established media cannot communicate everything about public affairs. There is neither space in newspapers or magazines or time in television or radio to do so. So time limitations impose especially severe constraints on television news broadcasting. Each half-hour network news program devotes only about 20 minutes to the news. The rest of the time is really taken up by commercials, and there is even less news on local television. During elections, personification encourages horse race journalism, right, in which media coverage becomes a matter of who's ahead in the polls, who's raising the most money, who got TV ads, and who's getting endorsed. The U.S. television presents elections as contests between individuals rather than confrontations between representatives of opposing parties and platforms. Studies of network news coverage of recent presidential campaigns have shown that more stories are shown covering the horse race than actual policy issues. And we're going to go into great detail when we talk about this in chapters 8 and 9. So until the early 1960s, most people reported getting more political news from newspapers than from any other source. So television nudged out newspapers as the public's major source of news in the early 1960s. In recent years, however, People have relied less on television for their primary news source, dropping from 82% in 1992 to 70% in 2020. In a 2020 survey of news media usage, 80% of respondents said that they had read or heard about prior, day, prior day's news through print or broadcast media, newspapers, television, radio. However, the survey described half the population as news grazers, those who check the news from time to time rather than to read, watch, or listen at regular times. Some 70% of young respondents, ages 18 to 24, were news grazers, in contrast to almost 70% of older respondents, age 65 and over, who followed the news regularly. Then news grazers said they followed stories only when dramatic events occurred and they lost interest otherwise. Overall, people indicate more interest in local news than in news about national or international events. Well, we know that the media influences public opinion, and that's what this lecture is all about, right? So Americans overwhelmingly believe that media exert a strong influence on their political institutions, and almost 9 out of 10 Americans believe that the media strongly influence public opinion. However, measuring the extent of influence on public opinion is really difficult. Because few of us learn about political events except through the media, it can be argued that the media create public opinion simply by reporting the news. Consider the dismantling of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Surely the photographs of joyous Berliners demolishing that symbol of oppression affected American public opinion about the reunification of Germany. The media can have dramatic effects on particular events. I'm suggesting the insurrection of January 6, 2021, and the images that came out, both on the television, but mostly on the internet, 
of what was going on in the Capitol building and the effect, the emotional effect, the impact that it had on Americans generally. So as noted in earlier in this lecture, in a democracy now, communication must move right in two directions, from government to citizens and citizens to government. In fact, political communication in the United States seldom goes directly from government to citizens without passing through the media. The point is important because news reporters tend to be highly critical of politicians. They consider it their job to search for inaccuracies in fact or weaknesses in argument. Some observers have characterized the news media and the government as adversaries, each mistrusting the other, locked in competition for popular favor while trying to set the record straight. I think the last four years proved testament to that fact. To the extent that this is true, then, the media serve both the majoritarian and the pluralist models of democracy by improving the quality of information transmitted to the people about their government. So the mass media transmit information in the opposite direction by reporting citizens' reactions to political events and government actions. The press has traditionally reflected public opinion, well, and often created it, while defining the news and suggesting courses of government action. But the media's role in reflecting public opinion has become much more refined in the information age. After commercial polls, such as Gallup polls that we talked about earlier, were established in the 1930s, newspapers really began to report reliable readings of public opinion. By the 1970s, some news organizations acquired their own survey research division. Occasionally, print and electronic media have joined forces to conduct major national surveys. For example, the well-respected New York Times that I talked about, or the CBS News Poll, conducts surveys that are first aired on CBS Evening News and then analyzed at length in the Times, in the New York Times. So although polls sometimes create opinions just by asking questions, the net effect has been to generate more accurate knowledge of public opinion and to report that knowledge back to the public through the media. Although widespread knowledge of public opinion does not guarantee government responsiveness to popular demands, as I'm suggesting, such knowledge is necessary if government is to function according to this pluralistic model of democracy that I'm yammering on about. And to beat a dead horse absolutely senseless, we're talking not just about the media and the role of media and how the media works, but how it conflates or how it interacts then with the political socialization of the electorate, right? That's the bottom line of what it is we're trying to get to. So rebearing in mind the media, putting out information, putting out knowledge, and the ability of the populace, the ability of the mass public versus the attentive public to absorb that and to think critically about that. That's what we're after here in pluralism. Most political learning today, as I suggested, is through these media political realities of television, the newspaper, the internet, and occurs far less frequently through experiential or interpersonal mode. So when was last, I said this last semester and somebody actually had, I was just crestfallen. How many people in here have recently had dinner with a United States Senator? The idea is, when was the last time you actually sat down and talked with an elected official? I mean, really talked to them and got from them directly their take on what's going on in government. It's always through these mediated political realities, television, newspaper, the internet. Television is still, the internet notwithstanding, the most important source of political information for the American citizenry. People turn to television even still, surprisingly, I just updated this research, internet is next, then radio, print, newspapers, and then following that, interpersonal channels of communication, playing supporting roles. So the media's influence on public opinion, you have to remember that the news media aren't necessarily after the truth. They're after ratings. If you're talking about television, the bread and butter of television is advertising, yes? The bread and butter of advertising is numbers. How many people are you getting to watch, right? And are they our demographic? So news media aren't after ratings, the truth necessarily, they're after the ratings. So we always want to watch media with a practiced eye. In other words, we want to watch for the media bias during the opening or the lead-in stories. We want to ask how representative or how generalizable the studies are. We try not to let the pictures being presented 
on the television screen overwhelm the facts. We want to beware of quoted sources with an agenda. When you quote a source, you want to know who that source is and what they're trying to achieve. When statistics are presented, is the underlying methodology explained? I.e., do you hear the principles of disclosure coming out? And finally, watch for rhetorical questions with no follow-up proof. It's a rhetorical question. There is no answer. They're not expecting an answer. And it's not argue, argued. It's not followed up upon. It's simply a statement, a question, rather, that's meant to lead the viewer to a conclusion. So what the media does is set the agenda for public discourse, for public opinion. Media makes decisions about what stories to emphasize and what stories to ignore. Based on what? Based on ratings, mostly, but this impacts the political agenda by creating salience, which is why I yammered on about salience. The more we talk about a subject, the more likely it is to hit the political agenda. Why do we talk about a subject? The media talks about it. We just don't naturally, through grassroots, begin talking about a subject. Usually it's a bigger discussion in the media. We talk about these things because it's in the media a lot. Is it in the media because we're talking about it, or are we talking about it because the media is talking about it? If the media makes a big deal about an issue, if there's a lot of salience, politicians have to respond to it. People are going to be listening for the politicians to respond because they're salient, they're aware of the issue. If the media ignores an issue, the issue will probably not get much attention, and it'll go away. Very short, right? Especially when you're dealing with the mass public. So the media sets an agenda-setting role. But, you know, the media also serves functions in a pluralistic society. Here's how. Surveillance, interpretation, and socialization. Surveillance includes public surveillance, or what I like to call the spotlight of publicity. Our politicians are under the spotlight. They're under the watchful eye of the media. And so they act with that in mind. Staying informed makes people feel secure, especially in times of crisis. And so the media's role of helping people feel informed helps promote a stable society because it makes us feel secure. Surveillance is a function of the mass media. Another function is interpretation. The media helps me interpret what I'm seeing. Psychology tells us a lot about individual attitudes toward the news. For example, you have cognitive, affective, and behavioral responses. A cognitive response is what a person believes. An affective response is how the person feels. A behavioral response is how the person expects to behave. Now, I'm not leading you down the rabbit hole here. There is a direct correlation to what I'm talking about and public opinion, political socialization, and the Madisonian model, the balance of power in the Constitution. Here's how. If the media tells me I don't, well, if the media tells me that Martians look strange, this is cognitive. This is something that I'm thinking. I'm thinking Martians look strange. That is going to have an effect on me. I'm not going to like Martians. This is going to be an attitude. Martians look strange. I don't like Martians. Then finally it's going to trip into behavior. I don't want my daughter to marry a Martian because I don't like Martians. Because they look strange. You may think this silly. Fine. Immigrants. 1890. The Hungarians. The Poles. Look at the cartoons in the political discourse in the 1890s about the Hungarians, the Italians, and how they're portrayed. The media is telling us that Hungarians are dark and dirty and sloppy and ignorant, and that Italians are drunk and uneducated and slovenly. They look strange. I don't like them. I don't want them around me. Look at the media and how the media drove public opinion in the 1890s, and then look again. Because everything <laughs> old is new again, right? History repeats itself, they say. Santayana. What is it today that the media is telling us looks strange so that we don't like it and so that we don't want it? We go from thinking to 
affecting to behaving. Check. Again, building the public discourse. Socialization, this idea of how we get familiar with and how we grow into our place in political society, has to include a discussion about the media and its use of propaganda. Now, you've probably had some elements of this in other classes, perhaps critical thinking. That's fine. And I'd like to revisit that just very quickly. How to recognize and correct for media propaganda. Just as if you're being presented with a poll that is suspect. That's trying to get you to believe something by virtue of playing numbers one way or another. Or misleading questions or any tool, any, of, any effect of statistical reporting that is meant to drive an opinion. So do propaganda techniques. So this is directly related to public opinion and the political discourse. These are some of the many propaganda techniques, and I'm going to go through these individually. Glittering generalities, name calling, plain folks, euphemisms, bandwagon, red herrings, the slippery slope, illogical predications, and fear. So my friends, I got to tell you, turn on Fox, turn on MSNBC, turn on CNN, turn on NPR sometimes. It doesn't matter. You'll hear some elements of this. It's really kind of fun to do propaganda spotting once you're kind of clued into what's going on. Glittering generalities. This is an American health care plan based on American principles and designed for the American people. It tells you absolutely nothing about the health care plan. It's trying to drive home the fact that it's an American health care plan based on American principles, designed for, the, okay, so, so, okay, fine. So this is propaganda. I'm thinking a little more critically, what are American principles? What do you think American principles are? What is the writer trying to get me to believe? If you take out the glittering generality, the good word, and either do away with it or be clear about what it is that you're saying, do I still come to the same conclusion? This is a good health care plan based on good principles designed for good people. It doesn't have the same oomph. Right? Because American is a good glittering generality. It has, it has a resonance to it. Okay. Well, fine. Good. Right. Democracy. Patriotism. Now, if I did my job right, you guys fell into my trap earlier when I was talking about nationalism and chauvinism. Remember? When we were talking about political information. And I used patriotism as a synonym for nationalism. And I got you to buy into nationalism and my definition of nationalism by using the word patriotism. And I watched heads nod. Because patriotism is a good thing. Right? I used the word knowingly, strategically, so that you would buy what I was saying without questioning it. I really didn't define nationalism. I said that it's akin to patriotism, and heads nodded away and off we went. You were my guinea pigs, and it worked. So when you hear a glittering generality... Take that word out and say, wait a minute, Mike, wait, 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 uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Just don't substitute one word for another. Tell me, what does nationalism mean? What is the definition? You follow? So using glittering generalities as a propaganda tool is suspect. But the same is true for name-calling. The changes that have made in our approach to welfare turn out just to be welfare for the rich. So this is the opposite, welfare for the rich, name-calling. Welfare, in this sense, is bad. Well, it depends on, you know, who you ask. Welfare could be a safety net that would save lives. But welfare for the rich, when you combine them together, is name-calling. You can't trust Governor Orlick. He spends all his time dealing with politicians. Politicians is name-calling. They're bad politicians. Well, governor, he's a governor. He's a politician. And so spending all his time with politicians is name-calling. Feminazi, I just heard this the other day again. I couldn't believe it. So what they're doing is they're using the term Nazi as a name-calling technique and bringing in all the aspects of Nazism that we have inherently within us. The Holocaust, World War II, Germany, fascism, Nazism, and they're coupling it to feminism or to a person who is so feminist that they rise to the level of being a Nazi or that they are fascist about it. So in this sense, then, a feminazi is somebody who is like beyond the pale they're a feminist then to the point of fascism, of concentration camps and, and 
extermination and Holocaust? What, what are you saying? Again, name calling is a propaganda technique that makes us accept an idea without critically thinking it through. Again, the rule of the media in developing public opinion, plain folk, ah, I'm just like you. So the idea is that plain folks were just like you. You don't believe me. Think about it for a minute. Bill Clinton loved trashy spy novels and Big Macs. And he had to run because he loved Big Macs, Macs a little too much. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush hated broccoli. Took great heat from the broccoli farmers. Jimmy Carter lusted after women in his heart, or so he said in a Playboy interview. Just like you, plain folk. I'm just like you. But the quintessential one, Ronald Reagan. Anybody remember? He had a bowl of something on his desk. Anybody remember? I rest my case. So you have um, almost 30 years, and we still remember that Ronald Reagan had a bowl of jelly bellies, jelly beans on his desk. This was a plain folk mechanism. Ronald Reagan's charm at the time was that he was everybody's grandfather. He was kind of doting. He was kind of aw shucksy, uh, very plain folk, very down to earth. Uh, but he was also President Reagan. He was the most powerful man really much on the planet at that point. And so, but the fact that he had a bowl of jelly beans on his desk was everybody's grandfather. Right? That's what a grandfather does. And that we would remember that 30 years later, I think, is testament to this as a propaganda technique. Very powerful. Euphemisms. Having one thing and calling it another is a euphemism, and you can use euphemisms to spin something one way or another. For example, the Peacekeeper Missile. This is, again, this is a Ronald Reagan thing. Uh, it, was, it was his term. It was an intercontinental ballistic nuclear weapon. But they called it the Peacekeeper Missile because it was intended to keep the peace or peace through strength. Collateral damage. This sounds familiar. Does anybody know what this is? Civilians getting hurt in military actions, right? Collateral damage. Okay. My favorite list, though, is, well, they're all really the same thing. Doctor-assisted suicide, euthanasia, shortening the dying, dying process, mercy killing, suicide, aid in dying, death with dignity, Good life, good death, a death sentence. They all refer to the same thing. And so whether you're trying to spin it for good or if you're trying to spin it to get people to not like it depends on which euphemism you use. So you're reading the newspaper, you're listening to a television report, listen for euphemisms. Listen for what word they choose to use to see if it's meant to drive your opinion. A red herring is a debating tactic whereby an argument is avoided rather than refuted. When the debater is faced with a hard-to-refute argument, a really great strategy is to change the topic. Don't answer it. Just change the topic. They do this all the time, especially in debates, in presidential debates. It's, it's just comedic sometimes. Uh, this great quote, You know, I've been going to think that there is some merit in the Republicans' tax cut plan. I suggest that if you come up with something like it, I suggest that you come up with something like it because if we Democrats are going to just survive as a party, we have to got to show that we are as tough-minded as the Republicans since that's what the public wants. So it's not about the Republican tax cut plan. Now the red herring is the Democrats being as strong as the Republicans. If you want to survive as a party, don't talk about the tax cut plan. Talk about the division between the parties, right, and how the parties are different. Red herring. Slippery slope is the idea of incrementalism in an argument. We talked about slippery slope when we were talking about the introduction of uh, a religious test, the lemon test in civil liberties. We have to stop the tuition increase. The next thing you know, they'll be charging $40,000 a semester. I actually heard this from a colleague, right, when they were increasing tuition. It's not that they're not going to increase, but the slippery slope idea is to take it to its extreme, to take it to its absurd end. The U.S. shouldn't get involved militarily in other countries. Once the government sends in a few troops, it will then in, send in thousands to die. Okay, We've got to stop them from banning pornography. Once they start banning one form of literature, though, they will never stop. Next thing you know, they'll be burning all the books. There's a huge leap in all three of these examples. 
And the question is, if they're using slippery slope to get your attention or to get you to agree, why? If you take out the slippery slope and make your argument pure and simple, does it have the same effect? Illogical predications. All 20th century fascist regimes were pro-gun control. Joe Schmo is pro-gun control. Therefore, Joe Schmo is a fascist. Illogical predications. This is used all the time. The streets of our country are in turmoil. The universities are filled with students rebelling and rioting. Communists are seeking to destroy our country. Russia is threatening us with her might. And the republic is in danger. Yes, danger from within and without. We need law and order. Without it, our nation cannot survive. Now, before you answer who said this, let's take this quote and look at it as a propaganda tool because it's perfect, because this person was like the master propagandist. The streets of our country are in turmoil. Turmoil, name-calling technique. Turmoil suggests uncontrolled anarchy. The universities are filled with students rebelling and rioting. What is rebelling and rioting? Are they actually turning over police cars and, and burning down buildings? Or are they picketing? Are they marching? Are they conducting a sit-in? What is rebelling and rioting? Well, you're trying to get me to believe something, so I would imagine that you're setting up an argument for a counter-argument. So there's turmoil, there's rebelling, there's rioting, and then there's communists seeking to destroy our country, and Russia is threatening us with her might. The republic is in danger, danger from within and without. You, you feel the, the theme, right? Oh my gosh, the sky is falling. Now, we need law and order. That'll fix it, right? Law and order as a glittering generality. You can't argue with law and order. Law and order is good. Depends on who's defining law and order, yes? Depends what their definition of law and order is. So now we get it. The students were picketing. They were demonstrating. They were trying to affect political change. The communists were just another political party. Russia was maintaining her sovereignty, maintaining her border's sovereignty in the face of German expansionism. The republic was a fascist state, but using the word republic was a glittering generality. And again, law and order. You can use the fear technique for good. Please don't get me wrong. Propaganda is a powerful tool and it can often be used for good. A television commercial portrays a terrible automobile accident, which is the fear appeal, and reminds viewers to wear their seat belts, which is a fear-reducing behavior. A pamphlet from an insurance company includes pictures of houses destroyed by floods, the fear appeal, and follows up with details about homeowners insurance, which is the fear-reducing behavior. There's a new commercial out with that, I forget which insurance company has got that very deep voice. Thank you. Okay. And there's um, a, young, a young mother, beautiful young African-American mother with two kids, two girls, and their house is on fire. And they're on the lawn, and she's cowering on the lawn. Have you seen this? with her two kids, like under a blanket. And this is the fear-inducing image. The fear-reducing behavior is to have, what was it, Allstate? To have Allstate, because the next image they show is the same mother and the two daughters in a hotel room, relaxing, watching TV, maybe eating, safe, comforted, protected. A letter from a pro-gun organization begins by describing a lawless America in which only criminals own guns. The fear appeal and concludes by asking readers to oppose a ban on automatic weapons, which is the fear-reducing behavior. So you can use this to political ends. But again, it's a propaganda technique. Describing a lawless America in which only criminals own guns isn't the whole picture. In order to make an informed decision, we need more information. But it's a very powerful tool. Public opinion does not rule in America. On most issues, it merely sets general boundaries for government policy. People form their values through the process of political socialization. The most important socialization agents in childhood and young adulthood are family, school, community, and peers. Members of the same social group tend to experience similar socialization processes and thus adopt similar views. People in different socialization groups hold different values often express vastly different opinions. 
Differences in education, race, and religion tend to produce sharper divisions of opinion today on questions of order and equality than do differences in income, region, or ethnicity. Most people don't think about politics in ideological terms. When asked to do so by pollsters, however, they readily classify themselves along a progressive conservative continuum. Many respondents choose the middle category, moderate, because the choice is safe. Others choose it because they have liberal views on some issues and conservative views on others. Their political orientation is better captured by a two-dimensional framework that analyzes ideology according to the values of order and equality. Responses to the survey question we use to establish our ideological topology divide the American electorate almost equally as progressives, conservatives, libertarians, and communitarians. The one-fifth of the public that gave progressive responses, favoring government action to promote equality but not to impose order, was exceeded by the one-third of the public that gave conservative responses to promote order. At almost 30% of the public, the communitarians who wanted government to impose both order and equality clearly exceeded the libertarians who wanted government to do neither. In addition to ideological orientation, many other factors influence the forming of political opinions. When individuals stand to benefit or suffer from proposed government policies, they usually base their opinions of these policies on self-interest. When citizens lack information on which to base their opinions, they usually respond anyway, which leads to substantial fluctuations in poll results, depending on how questions are worded and on intervening events. So sometimes the public shows clear and settled opinions on government policy, conforming to a majoritarian model. However, public opinion is often not firmly grounded in knowledge and may be unstable on given issues. Moreover, political groups often divide on what they want government to do. This lack of consensus leaves politicians with a great deal of latitude in enacting specific policies, a finding that conforms to our pluralist model. Of course, politicians' actions are under very close scrutiny by journalists reporting in the mass media. The mass media transmit information to large, heterogeneous, and widely dispersed audiences through print and broadcast. The main function of mass media is entertainment, but the media also perform the political functions of reporting news, interpreting news, influencing citizens' opinions, setting the political agenda, and socializing citizens about policy. The broadcast media operate under technical ownership and content regulations imposed by the government which tend to promote the equal treatment of political contests on radio and television more than in newspapers and news magazines. We know that Washington, D.C. hosts the biggest press corps in the world, but only a portion of those correspondents concentrate on the presidency. Because Congress is a more decentralized institution, it is covered in a more decentralized manner, right? All professional journalists recognize rules for citing sources that guide their reporting. What actually gets reported in the media depends on the media's gatekeepers, the publishers, and the editors. Although Americans today get more news from television than from newspapers, newspapers usually do a more thorough job of informing the public about politics. Despite heavy exposure to news in the print and electronic media, the ability of most people to think critically and to retain much political information is shockingly low. The media's most important effect on public opinion is in setting the country's political agenda. The role of the news media may be more important for affecting interactions among attentive policy elites than in influencing public opinion. The media play a more subtle, contradictory role in political socialization, both promoting and undermining certain political and cultural values. Reporters from the national media tend to be more progressive than the public 
as judged by their tendency to vote Democratic and by their own self-description. However, if the media systematically demonstrate pronounced bias in their news reporting, it tends to work against incumbents and frontrunners, regardless of their party, rather than in favor of progressive Democrats. So, from the standpoint of majoritarian democracy, one of the most important effects of the media is to facilitate pluralism, to facilitate communication from the people to the government and among the people themselves through the reporting of public opinion polls. The media zealously defend the freedom of the press, even to the point of encouraging disorder, by granting extensive publicity to violent protests, terrorist acts, and other threats to the public order. So now to turn to our seminar question, revisit it with an eye to what we've learned about political socialization, public opinion, polling, the role of media, and propaganda. How does the political socialization of the U.S. electorate add to or detract from the Madisonian model? So now you have your essay more fully formed. I said you have your thesis statement in paragraph one. Paragraph two is def to define the Madisonian model. Now, paragraphs three, four, and five are to define the electorate. How? By looking at one, public opinion distribution, mass public, attentive public, opinion makers, stability, fluidity. Right? Two, whether public opinion actually has an effect on candidates' behavior. And three, the role of the media in forming and reporting public opinion. Then you go back to the Madisonian model, the balance of power. So how do these three elements individually add to or detract from the Madisonian model? In other words, how does opinion polling add to or detract from the balance of power? Right? And so what you want to do then is to take each one of those three elements and juxtapose it to the Madisonian model, the balance of power. Now I'm going to make you throw bricks at me. Remember that there are two aspects of the Madisonian model, substantive and procedural, right? You have the structure of the Madisonian model that creates three branches of government, the states. Then you have the process of the Madisonian model, whereby within the legislative process, representatives come up with laws or make laws. It's at that point that conversation happens, that we expect our legislators to listen to public opinion. So, if I've done my job right, you should be able to walk out of class now and be able to at least come up with a good thesis statement and an outline for the seminar question. And so that brings us to the end of our chapter six lecture, Political Socialization, the Role of the Media. Thank you for your patience. Again, this was a long lecture, two and a half hours-ish, a lot to sit through, a lot of information to, to take in. I thank you for attending class today. I look forward to reading your essays. Next week, we're touching on chapter seven in Bards et al., which is interest groups. And so we take what we learned today in political socialization and funnel it through the organized activities of interest groups. It'll be fascinating. I look forward to, to talking to you about it and to reading your papers on that as well. Again, this is Mike Corrali with the introduction to United States Government Online. See you next week. Mm -hmm.